I never know how to really describe it, except maybe, I don't know, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. It's like asking Miles, how does your horn sound, you know what I mean? He didn't really, I don't think he really tell you, you know? No, I, don't, I hate to talk about panic. It's, it's sort of on automatic, you know, most, most of the time. Jean-Michel, you can always remember the first time you saw him. He was coming to Los Angeles to do his first show with Larry Gagosian. I worked at Eureka Cantor Gallery. We were having an opening and Jean-Michel came in and in like maybe five minutes, he took the back office area and turned it into like this VIP zone. We just like laughed and, you know, wouldn't let people back there or like only cool people back there. He was pretty funny like that. I was going to film school while I was working in the gallery and Jean-Michel was also obsessed with film. Originally said like, hey, you should make a movie about me. And I was like, oh yeah, because you're going to be famous one day and you know, and I'm going to be a filmmaker. But it's like, he was right. This is a high quality film, right? <laughs> I don't know out there in TV land. Downtown New York in the 80s was crazy. Even though it was kind of dangerous, it also was cheap so artists could live there. And I think that it kind of provided this incredible freedom for people to create and do things because there were no rules. It was chaos downtown. While the psychic cost of all this visual pollution is incalculable. I think a lot about Jean-Michel in those times because he was really like one of those iconic people that you would see down there. And he also was somebody that could link some people like myself to other cultures. He could take you to a club downtown where African Bombada was, and you could just move throughout the night from concert to art show to friend's house. Every night was like an adventure. Every night was crazy. I was so lucky that he let me in the studio because normally he wouldn't let people in the studio because he would find them distracting. You know, I used to have assistants a lot mm -hmm. around me, and then on days when they wouldn't come, it would be a lot more productive. You know? He would put music on, he would probably smoke a joint, and he would go from one piece to another, just working in these little bits here and there. What music do you like? Bebop, so I guess my favorite music. But I don't listen to it all the time, I listen, I listen to everything. I remember like singing to the top of our lungs, Boston, more than a feeling. You know, that was like his favorite song for one summer. Jean-Michel looked at how music was transforming using samples, and he was like, well, if the musicians can borrow from James Brown, why can't I borrow from Cy Twombly? He's referencing Rauschenberg or Twombly. He wants you to see that he's referencing African art, but also he's referencing his Haitian background. And when I did the film, I would look at the paintings and I could see what books he was reading at that time or what cartoon he was watching or what movie he might be looking at. I'm usually in front of the television. I have to have some source material around here to, uh, to work with. I don't know, you know, magazines, textbooks. Everything that he was influenced by, made a little appearance in his paintings. What's your earliest, most vivid childhood memory? Probably getting hit by a car, I guess. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? I was playing in the street. How old were you? I was seven, seven or eight years old. When he was in the hospital, his mom gave him Grey's Anatomy and he would draw the body parts and things like that. Even as a child, you see it in his paintings. A lot of times you'll see what looks like scar. I think even in your painting, it's like scars. And so um, that had a tremendous effect on him. The depths and the layers are also really interesting to me. I would watch him paint something and then an hour later just paint over it, you know, and you'd be like, what was that for? and it adds this incredible depth to the work. And like even looking in the mouth, it's like it's a tunnel, you know? It's like it just is so deep in there because there's probably like six or seven paintings underneath. They're as loud as like listening to jazz, you know? It's like a loud solo. They're not quiet paintings. They're not peaceful paintings. They're shouting at you paintings. Jean-Michel loved the idea that he was a mystery, that he was kind of a, an enigma. Once people started telling stories about him, I think he realized that those stories kind of created this mythical character. 
He had this idea, even at like 20, 22 years old, that he was gonna be super famous. Like he thought he was gonna be the next Picasso. And I think he would be super, super happy because he did what he said he was gonna do. He guaranteed his placement in art history. But I also feel like he opened the door for other African-American artists. To me, the sadness is just that he's not here enjoying it because he would have a lot of fun.